Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan with another episode of the Influence Continuum. And have I got a subject of interest for you today. Uh, I have a fascinating, uh, amazing guest to share with you. I'm going to just read a little intro. I hope you don't mind, Dr. Stern. I'm just going to say in 2007, Dr. Robin Stern coined the, ga the phrase gaslight effect to explain the long-term effects of repeated gaslighting, an insidious and sometimes covert form of emotional abuse in which a gaslighter undermines and controls another person by deflecting, twisting, and denying their reality. Gaslighting can happen in a romantic relationship between family members or even at work. But in every case, it leaves you constantly second-guessing yourself unable to make simple decisions, and destabilized from the constant reality shifts. And I want to say Robin Stern, PhD, is a licensed psychologist with over 30 years, is co-founder and associate director at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. She's the author of The Gaslight Effect, which I have read and think it's terrific. Thank but, you. But Robin Stern has a new uh, guidebook out called The Gaslight Effect Recovery Guide. Um, and so I just skim read it, and it's terrific. And I guess the last thing I want to say is, Robin, we met because you invited me on your podcast called The Gaslight Effect Podcast. That's how we got to know each other at first. I can't believe we didn't know each other after all these decades of working on parallel tracks of undue influence, but thank goodness we are now connected. So after you interviewed me, I'm like, you have to come on my show. So I'm delighted. Uh, Dr. Robin Stern, the Gaslight Effect Recovery Guide. And with that, I'm going to ask you to set the table, assume my... My listeners have heard the term gaslight because we know how popular the term has gotten, right? And I believe your publisher asked you to update your book after a certain person got elected. Um, so tell us your tell us how you came to become an expert in this subject, please. Well, thank you very much, and please call me Robin, Steve, and I will call you Steve if Deal. you don't. Want. Okay. Um, so I delighted to be here. And as you said, what a happy coincidence that, um, not a coincidence, but happy timing that we met uh, just last week or the week before on my podcast. And and here I am on your podcast. And, um, it, and I believe that it was meant to be that we meet each other at this time mm. in our professional careers, because we have. And it is kind of interesting that all this other time that has gone by, we just worked independently, as did many other people. Mm. But I, I'm so happy of this acquaintance now. And I, um, I've always been interested in cults, actually. Mm. And I, I may have told you in our last conversation that when I was wanting to do my thesis, I wanted to do my thesis on cults. Your and doctoral thesis, I believe. Uh huh. Thesis. I was studying at NYU, and I had this wonderful professor, Philip Merrifield, who had a theory of, of intelligence. And the one area of his theory that had not been built out was social intelligence. Mm -hmm. I was very interested in that as a, as a therapist. Mm -hmm. I was practicing um, in a clinic at that point. And um, I thought, I, okay, I really am very interested in, in charismatic leadership. Uh, my father was very charismatic. I knew many other people who were charismatic in, in a wonderful way mm -hmm. um, growing up. And I I wanted to join a cult. And he said, no, you cannot <laughs> join a cult. And I said, I, I would never get sucked in. Don't worry about it. He said, no. This and, is your dissertation advisor, not your dad. We know your dad would have said, no, you can't go join a cult. Right. Yes, but, right. Okay. Just to dissertation be clear. Advisor dissertation advisor he said take a tiny aspect of it mm. and, 
and study it. And so I developed a measure at that time of social intelligence for young people, um, which I wasn't in love with doing, but I thought, okay, so this is my entry point. I, right. I, this is a brick in the house I'm building or in the beginning of something. And uh, so that sometime later, here we are to come back to my interest in your work, which is that individual manipulation that happened for you and for other people who are seduced and manipulated into thinking um, thinking about the world through the eyes of the manipulator, the cult leader. And it, it's just an incredible journey. I had seen the movie Gaslight mm. so many times as a kid because I loved film and I would regularly watch. And um, when I began to, in my practice, see women who were strong and capable and decisive, I'm kind of falling apart at the hands or involved with men who were certain and confident and completely willing to tell the woman what they should be thinking or what they are in fact thinking or what they're seeing mm. that might be different than actually what they saw. Um, I, I just said, wow, I need to think about this a little bit more. I need to talk to people who are experiencing this a little bit more, and I need to write about this. Great. And, and, and I myself, Steve, is, as you may remember, had an experience of being gaslighted by my ex-husband, and it was not a major um, hurt for me. Mm -hmm. It was um, actually... A, a moment of fascination because I was writing about gaslighting. And he was telling me, um, the brief story is that he was late a lot. I used to tell him being late is not okay with me because I feel disrespected and I don't like it. And he would turn the tables on me as gaslighters do mm. and tell me, no, this is not my problem. This is yours because you have a problem with time. And even though I knew he was gaslighting me, inside, inside of me, I could feel maybe he's right. That shift to maybe he's right. Yeah, and let me just comment that this is such a common phenomenon with people who get recruited into cults is the certainty factor where mm -hmm. someone is looking you straight in the eyes and telling you that they know and the normal person goes, well, maybe, maybe I'm missing something, right? Because we don't want to be, you know, too self-assured or overconfident, right? But when it becomes a pattern, it's a problem. Yes. And gaslighting as brainwashing is, uh, is an overtime phenomenon. It doesn't happen in one instance. So there can be a moment where somebody attempts to gaslight you, but a gaslighting relationship and people who are suffering the gaslight effect are in it over time. Yeah. And time, the gaslighter is certain and insistent and clever and exquisitely tuned into you. Right. 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 So I do want to comment because I did see the, I think it was a 41 black and white movie, Gaslight and 44. 44. Thanks yeah. for the correction. And in that story, the guy was deliberately trying to make his uh, wife uh, uh, crazy, feel crazy because she wanted their money. So there That's we have a very clear predatory motivation. Yes. And yet, what I, as I was reading your book myself, I was thinking about so many clients I've had over 47 years and just how so many of these were gaslighting relationships. And I love you describing it as a tango. You need two. And we'll get into that in a minute. But for me, so many of these things were unconsciously playing out, not because one person said, I want this person's money and I want to drive them crazy, but because of their own dysfunctional childhood, because of their own wounds, their own narcissism and other factors. So it's, it's not always a clear, oh, this is a clear malignant narcissist predator who's after, you know, power, money or sex, like a lot of cult leaders. Yeah. Well, thank you for bringing that up because people always ask me um, when I'm 
being interviewed, except you don't have to because you already know better. But um, are people born gaslighters? Mm -hmm. And people are not born gaslighters, right? Gaslighters are, uh, have come to it through either social learning or through wounds in childhood that are then dealt with by writing themselves in a way that, that is blaming of someone else or destroying somebody else or trying to. And or sometimes gaslighters just happen into it and it works. Right. So there's a social learning possibility angle to this as well. But here's here's some feedback. So I I your book is written from primarily a woman's perspective. So the gaslighter, a noun, is male. And so as a male, I want to say, wait a minute, there are women gaslighters yeah. too. I know you yeah. know that for sure, but I just want to state it clearly, you know, and then the, you know, the other thing is, is just that uh, I'm nervous about using a noun, you know, to take a human being and make them into a thing mm. versus describing the behavior that's so dysfunctional. Yes. And I mean to be describing the role. Role. Okay, yeah. good. The role not the the person, uh, because of course you're right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the sum and substance of a person to be described as a gaslighter. Uh, you're a human being who is engaging in this kind of behavior to control the moment or to uh, keep your person completely dependent on you or to be the decision maker for the two of you all the time. Right. So there were so many models you educated me on that are new to me that I'd like to you to mention a few that I want uh, our listeners to, to grab your book and your recovery guide, uh, especially if they have someone in their life where they feel like mm -hmm. whenever they're interacting with them, they, they're thinking, am I crazy? I could have sworn we agreed to this. And now they're saying I never did or, you know, a million other examples, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so you talk about uh, stages of gaslighting that I think is particularly important. You mentioned different categories of gaslighter, the glamour gaslighter, the good person, good guy gaslighter, or the intimidator gas. So share a few nuggets uh, with our listeners, please. Sure, thank you. So the, the reason that I talked about stages is I saw them. Um, over 30 years, I would see someone come in and tell me about an instance, like for instance, you go to the movies with somebody and they tell you, um, uh, my God, like, do, do you have a problem with going to the movies with me tonight? You left me sitting in the seat. You were at the popcorn stand for so long. And you think it's a little weird. I was just buying popcorn. I don't have a problem with him. Like, Okay, whatever. He's a really nice guy. He's cute. Um, we're going to the movies. And the next time something like that happens, he says, you do have a problem with me, don't you? Just like when you were in the movie theater. You really don't want to be close to me. You're ambivalent about this relationship, aren't you? And you think, what's with this guy? And then he insists and he persists and he is certain that you are ambivalent in everything that you do that gives him evidence that you might be that person ambivalently connected to him, he says that same thing again. And you begin at that point to believe him. And so when you go from not, well, to, to second guess yourself, right. let me say that, to second guess yourself. So when you go from thinking that's a silly comment to second guessing yourself, you're going you're traveling through stage one into stage two. Mm -hmm. And then in stage two, once you are second guessing yourself, you still are rooted in your own reality, but you're defending yourself constantly. I am not that, I'm not ambivalent. I couldn't wait to come home tonight. I couldn't wait to get back to you in that seat. I couldn't wait to see you. I'm not at all ambivalent. I don't want to spend my holiday with someone else. I want to spend it with you. And he's arguing back and forth, but if, but if. And you're spending a lot of mind share mm. wondering who's right. Mm. Wait a minute. I thought, who's right in this argument? It's true that I I was away for a long time, but but I'm not ambivalent. And so rather than thinking 
about how you are feeling in the relationship Mm -hmm. rather than thinking, why am I constantly arguing the same argument? Or rather than engaging in this power struggle, you are then moving through, if you stay in it and you don't get out of the power struggle, you're moving through stage two to stage three. So stage three in gaslighting is when you really are standing in his shoes or in their shoes. If you're standing in the shoes of the gaslighter, the person taking on that role, and you see yourself the way they do. I am ambivalent. Like, why do I always do that to him? Like, I, he is right. I'm, I'm really ambivalent about him. Mm-hmm. And so that's a progression that happens over time. And it happens not because of the way you feel about somebody or are you certain or you're ambivalent, but because of the insistence on reality. And so it happens about who you are as, as a human being, um, the attributes you have, your uh, the way you look, the way you think, the way you um, uh, make decisions, the way where you put things, how people see you. It He can glom onto or they can glom onto anything. Right. So what I loved about your book is not only you defining stage one, two, and three, but you gave examples like you just did about the popcorn and the movie, Mm -hmm. and you give alternatives for how to protect yourself, like how to disengage, how not to merge, how not to fall into the empathy trap. Just give our listeners a little taste of some of the the practical uh, suggestions. I'm I'm glad you asked me about that because one of the things that I like about doing this work is really being helpful on the ground. And um, in order to be helpful on the ground, sometimes people need words, they need tools, they need things to say when they have the courage to say them. And so, of course, that's another set of tools. But for example, if somebody is arguing with you and you are in this back and forth power struggle, in this conversation that doesn't go anywhere, am I right? Are you right? Are you, is he right? Um, At some point, a simple opting out statement like, you know, you may be right, but right now I'm done with this conversation. Or we are going to have to agree to disagree. I love that one. I do that one. (laughs) You know, I let's I do want to talk about this, but what not right now, because when our emotions are heated, we're not going to get very far. Or We've been having this back and forth for so long, we're just not getting anywhere. Let's pick up the conversation at another time. Or simply, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep. And, uh, you know, my work is called, you know, freedom of mind. And I say, it's your mind, you should control it. And your work is all about this topic. And in fact, I talk about how we, we need to rewire our own brains so we have different reactions. We, we can evolve mm-hmm. to a future us yeah. that's healthier. And, 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 and so we're really on the same page completely, in my opinion, uh, that this is really about us uh, st- being in our bodies, mm-hmm. knowing our emotions, knowing our beliefs and our values, and also having a support system with people who truly love us and know us, who can reality test with us and go, you know what, that's not you. Like, huh? Exactly, exactly. And you're so right about the support system because sometimes it is just that person who says to you, you're doing what? Or he said what? That wakes you up to, to some another reality. One of the, um, what you just said, um, just is leading me to, to share what, one of the things that is so hard about detaching mm-hmm. from stage two, from stage three, and from the gaslight effect to begin with, um, or in, in, in its entirety. And that is the idea that you may have to withdraw without the other person thinking well of you. And I wonder about this in the life of cults, whether people um, are stuck in that way too, that if you assert yourself, if you have independent thought, then you're, you're risking the um, good graces and the esteem of your leader or maybe other people in the cult. And I know for patients um, 
year after year coming in saying, I, I can't stand it. I can't stand that he thinks that way of me. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I can't, he says that, that I'm forgetful, but I'm not. And until I can convince him, I, I could never leave because I couldn't live with his thinking about me that way. Yeah. So uh, my reaction to your question is certainly if you're born or raised in an authoritarian cult, religious or political or therapy or whatever, uh, you need to get the cult out of your head. Like the, your, I, I talked about a pseudo self that's created as a clone of the cult leader or the ideology that coming out is really realizing that the real me, you know, doesn't like that or likes art or wants to go to college and learn, even if it means my parents rejecting me and shunning me and my whole community turning on me or I realize I'm gay. And my community thinks that that I'm I'm uh, defective and I can't live in a toxic environment. So it's crucial for a, a former cult member, especially born or raised, to re- really dissect, take out the good stuff from the cult experience and the cult identity, but really re- recreate your sense of self based on who you want to be with a healthy future. And in my case, I was recruited into the Moonies at 19. So for me, I had a baseline. But when I first got out, I needed a lot of help to remember who I was before. What do you I needed about? people to tell me stories and show me pictures and videos and take me places. Because I had believed I had a terrible childhood. And my family was evil and I was suicidal and was like, not true. It was just total BS. Mm -hmm. But uh, as a cult leader, I realized this is a systematic part of the brainwashing Mm -hmm. to break down who you are to create this new dissociated identity that's dependent and obedient. Yeah. I mean, that is just fascinating. When you say, when you talk about needing to come back to yourself, wonder, uh, if it's similar for people in gaslighting relationships where what is required, what's necessary is to get away. Even it's for, it's for a day to get away, to talk to other people, as you said before, who love you, who care about you, who, for, with whom you feel safe, who are not distorting your reality so that you can have a back and forth and ground yourself in what perhaps used to be your reality or certainly even in that moment what do you feel? What are you thinking? What do you think about what just happened? Yeah, and it's almost impossible when you're in the thick of it, yes. whether it's a relationship, a job that you're dependent on for money, or in the midst of a religious organization where you're constantly getting reinforcement. It's it's almost impossible to reclaim your power because you need some bandwidth. Mm -hmm. And so I actually did a TEDx talk, how can I know if I've been brainwashed? I used my Mooney story at the beginning, and I talk about a four-step reality testing strategy. And guess what the first step is, what you just said, get away, turn off the phone, Mm -hmm. go on vacation, go camping, go in the woods, listen to music, dance. Mm -hmm. Um, just give yourself sleep, give yourself good food and exercise and such, because once you have that, then you can begin a process of learning. And as you said earlier, another critically important point, when humans are emotionally activated and aroused, especially with fear or anger or something really intense, Mm -hmm. Our, our frontal cortex goes offline. So we're not going to be as capable That's right. of developing a perspective and, you know, good decision making and reality testing and oh, such, right? Sure, because we're gripped by fear or anxiety. And yes. So I need to switch gears for one minute because I introduced the personal relationship, the work relationship, but I want to leap and then come back to the work relationship I want to come to what's happening right now on planet Earth, and in particular, what's happening in the United States, where so many people 
are doubting their sense of reality and are adopting this all or nothing black and white hatred of irrational, crazy beliefs. Well, you know, I think that coming off the pandemic, it's not that surprising that people would um, would have one be exhausted and not be at their decision making best, but also have been walking this ground of that's gaslighting ground, fertile for gaslighting, uh, because our lives have been unpredictable and things around us out of our control and uncertain for so long. Even now, I find that people are, <coughs> excuse me, uncertain about, um, should I wear a mask? Should I not? And other people very judgy about that. What's the, your problem? You're wearing a mask? Like the pandemic's over. And then on the other side, what's your problem? Are you like, Anti, an anti-scientist, like, no, the pandemic is not totally over. So not just disagreements, but the propensity to try to undermine the other person's reality because you disagree, because you have a different point of view. And um, I mean, during the pandemic, it was laughable, but it's not really laughable that reality was controlled by what news station you watched. Yeah. And so if you can watch channel X and you have one reality and another channel and there's another reality and you have a third reality or you're not really sure because things are crazy and you don't know what to believe or you used to believe the leaders of the country, but somehow it doesn't feel right, then what's the reality you're standing on? What's the ground? Yeah, we need information to function properly. It's part of my bite model of authoritarian control. We need information and, and we need to trust where that information is coming from. And we need the brain power. So we're at times where we're not hijacked to sift through that information. Right. So part of my research for the book, I won't say it's net title, no, The Cult of Trump. Uh, uh, was uh, the fourth generation warfare, which was a psychological warfare paradigm that was written up formally in the 80s by William Lind, who met with Donald Trump, I might add, and who paired with Paul Weirich of the Christian right. And uh, this is about attacking science, attacking experts, attacking institutions in order to create uncertainty and chaos. Mm -hmm. Because when people are uncertain, they're going to gravitate to the certainty authoritarian figure who says what is true. That's right. And how how comforting in some way to have that figure for people who are really at sea, people who just don't know where their compass is, people who have lost contact with their own ability to make a decision. Somebody comes in, that charismatic leader, who offers a promise yeah. something different. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, is that um, we're all children inside. I mean, we all developmentally grew from infanthood. And so when times when we're, you're feeling threatened, we're going to want a parental authority figure, mother or father figure to tell us yeah. to how to keep us safe, even if it's an illusion. Yes, it'll be more comforting than just trying to depend on ourselves and mm -hmm and ignore the fact that we're feeling so anxious or depressed or upset mm -hmm. and uncertain. Yeah. But let's circle back if I, so let, let's just stay one more minute on this topic, you know? So if I could give you a magic wand uh, and, and, and you had unlimited resources, what would you say would be a valuable step in the right direction to um, undo the polarization, the uncertainty, the mental health crisis that's happening in the U.S. right now? Well, first, I think about that all the time, um, yeah. because while we don't have magic wands, we at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence really do have a good place to start with um, educating children from the very earliest ages um, of, and the adults who touch their lives 
uh, about the importance of emotions and uh, why they matter in, in our lives and they matter for really important reasons. In fact, for all of our lives, they matter to um, uh, for memory and learning and, and um, they matter for decision-making and they matter for relationships and for mental health and physical well-being and emotions matter for creativity and everyday functioning. And so when, since we know emotions matter, we need to be skilled in recognizing them, understanding and labeling them and managing them. And, and you have an acronym called RULER. Yeah, Could you yeah. share that with us, our listeners, please? We have an acronym called RULER and RULER is our um, approach to bringing emotional intelligence into schools. And right now, the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence is in 5,000 schools around the world. Oh, and, awesome. And our approach trains adults first. And why is that? Because obviously the adults are teaching children and are modeling. Our children are watching us, whether we're teachers or right. school leaders or parents, they're watching us. And so um, we train the adults first in the skills of emotional intelligence and then in the teaching of emotional intelligence to students. And we work with the school to develop a, with this implementation team and the school itself to develop a culture of uh, emotional intelligence mm -hmm. where emotions mm -hmm. matter and are respected. So could you just run us by the RULER acronym sure. real fast? So, Thank you. Yes. So RULER stands for the skills of emotional intelligence for yourself and for others. So recognizing emotions. Yeah. What you're feeling in your body is a cue to you're having an emotion. Mm -hmm. um, recognizing when other people are having an emotion. Uh, you might not know what it is yet. If you're just recognizing, you notice a shift in um, body language, vocal tones, um, and you'll also notice that in yourself, facial expressions, bodily sensations. Right. And then there's understanding the causes. What caused me to have this emotion? Mm -hmm. What was I just doing a minute ago? What did I just hear while I was walking down the hallway? Uh, and labeling emotions, very critical to be mm -hmm. able to discern whether I'm feeling frustrated or angry. Because when you can say what you're feeling with accuracy, other people understand then hopefully how to respond to you. Right. Because what you would do to respond to somebody who's frustrated is different than what you would do to respond to somebody who's depressed, for instance. And yeah. very often, what do we say? We say, we're upset. I'm upset. You know, right. What do you really feel? And there's a wonderful app actually called How We Feel that uh, we at the Yale Center had the privilege of working on um, with the former uh, president former head of Pinterest, Ben Silverman, and his team. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is just a wonderful education in emotional intelligence and a way to expand your vocabulary, keep track of your feelings every single day. And um, so Ruler... I believe it's 99 cents because I bought it. No, yeah. it's free. So it's free. Old... Well, why did I pay 99 cents because... on the App Store? I got to check that out. Anyway, please continue. Well, you, I'll tell you why, because it used to be the mood meter. Uh -huh. And um, the mood meter, which is what the how we feel was based on, okay. um, we did have to charge 99 cents in order to maintain it. But because of the generosity of the grant from uh, Ben Silverman's team, not only uh, were we able to build it so it's free, but it's free in perpetuity. Great. So the name of the app is? How We Feel. How We Feel. Okay, download it. It's free, people. And it has a little heart as an icon. That's awesome. It is awesome. I, and it I do, I do want to tell you, just because we're talking about my work and your work and connection. So when people are born or raised in mind control cults, this is a piece of the work as a therapist I have to do. Because people are trained to suppress their emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the sh you should never be angry unless you're angry at ex-members or critics or something like that. 
there there are certain permissible emotions in certain contexts. But how do they tell you that? I mean, that that's I just I mean, I know that that's true, but nonetheless, to hear it from you, having lived it and done this work for all these years, it's still horrific to hear. It's horrific. I couldn't feel horny. I was 19 years old. I had to suppress my body and my emotions or my reactions if I met an attractive woman. Uh, if I was angry at a superior because he was an asshole and told me to do something which was really stupid, I had to do emotion, like we call it emotion blocking. We have thought stopping techniques and emotion blocking techniques in mind control to keep the pseudo self in charge. Mm. So all, you know, I'm homesick or I'm tired. I'm, sl I'm sleeping three hours a night. I need to sleep, mm. have to suppress that feeling mm. too. So it's, it's, a, but the trick about mind control cults is that, that, that cult identity is doing all of the continuation of the manipulation and, and, and such. You may need to be resent for reindoctrination to go to another workshop to you know get boosted. But what's interesting about mind control cults is the longer you're in, the less it works because it's so not connected to reality and all the failed prophecies and and the the more negative experiences you have. You suppress them, but they're still in your mind. Mm -hmm. And eventually you get to a point where people will say to me, I don't care if I'm going to hell. I can't stand it here one more minute. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I just can't stand it. Yeah. You know? And that's anyway. actually very similar to what people say when they've had enough of a gaslighting relationship, where they say, mm -hmm. uh, I, I know I put up with this before. I don't even like myself anymore. I just can't stand this one more minute. Yeah, it becomes toxic and you know it. And then so the question is, what's within your power to do? Yeah. And people often need help to create an exit strategy. Yes. And often it's about breaking it into smaller pieces, like taking time out to get away to think, you know, and consulting a financial advisor or, you know, going to a therapist. This right. or a coach right. that has helped other people successfully navigate this, and I know you've done a tremendous amount over decades. Well, thank uh, you. I want you. to fit. I want to go back and finish the um, ruler acronym because please, I talked about recognizing self yep. uh, emotions and self and others, please. understanding in self and others, labeling self and others, and um, those are the experiencing part of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And then the action part is, okay, so we have this feeling. I know where it's coming from. I know what specific emotion it is. Mm -hmm. How am I expressing it? And am I expressing it? And are there constraints like you're talking about? Am I not allowed to express it? Am I not allowed to even have it in my family, mm -hmm. in my workplace, in this community? And if so, what do I do with it instead? Right. And then right. regulating emotions, we think of that as a healthy thing as opposed to emotion blocking. Right. But stopping. But regulating emotions so that you can feel a sense of connectedness to yourself. And you know, and yet um it, even with a strong emotion, gather yourself so that you can express what you want to express at the right time in the right way to the right person. Yep. Great. It's so it's such a valuable tool. I'm so excited to know that it's in schools, but it needs to be taught to the general public, in my opinion. Well, Mark um, Brackett wrote a fantastic book. He's our director and our co-founder. And uh, he wrote a book called Permission to Feel, which is the step great. Towards, per, towards being emotionally intelligent. Give yourself and others the permission to feel and um, anyone can buy it. It's, yeah, so uh, I may need to interview him next. Uh, you may but, need to interview him. Yeah, next. It, it's it's so vital. You know, Robin, I am I'm so thrilled to know your work, and and you know, for me, I've been just 
trying to learn over these decades. And I, I got to a point where I was saying to my clients, you know, think about emotions as your friends. Mm -hmm. You want to listen to them, but you don't want to be controlled by them. And I like the parts thing of imagining a big, you know, conference table and you're the CEO and all your different parts with, that have the different feelings. A lot of my clients are so traumatized. They have parts that have been isolated or, or fragmented off. Yes. And they're working on automatic pilot, thinking that they're still a five-year-old who was sexually abused when they're 25 years old and have a lot of resources they didn't have as a five-year-old. But getting, getting permission to access that part and listen. Yeah. Well, and, giving yourself the permission and also knowing that... Um, you have the opportunity to be an emotion, what we call an emotion scientist, to be curious about your emotions, to know mm. that there's information that you're getting from each emotion, to be a learner, not a knower, to have a, um, to know that you can, it, it's not a, um, uh, the expression I'm looking for, you're always at the growing edge. You're always yeah, and 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 I I I love Adam Grant's book uh, Think Again, mm -hmm. and it really is a call to be open to changing your mind, separate your yes. ego from your beliefs, yes. expose yourself to other points of view right. that are out of the box of anything you're familiar with. That's right, and trust that you can take care of your own emotions if you're uncomfortable. Okay, so you feel uncomfortable. What can you do with that? And those are the skills of emotional intelligence. And those skills are vital in freeing yourself from gaslighting, to be able yeah. to manage yourself in that moment where you can't really think straight. Maybe you will, all you can do is breathe. Maybe all you can do is leave the field for a moment so that you can gather yourself, so that you can think, wait a minute, do I really think that? Why not? Yeah, so, so valuable. And as you were talking, I couldn't help but think about people who are numbing themselves out through drugs or alcohol or zoning out into video gaming where they don't have to think or be real and they can pretend they're somebody else mm -hmm. and disappear. But then when they're done with that, you're still you. You're still, and, and if you have a disposition about those emotions and that difficult moment that um, they're negative and bad and it was horrible, then you, you lose the opportunity to learn something. Yeah. About yourself. And, and to be your best friend. And to be your best friend and to have compassion for yourself. Yes. So uh, good boundaries, uh, overcoming the urge to merge, not feeling like you have to convince the other person that that you know who you are if they're so sure, and and basically getting help because in the end you want to not be in a toxic relationship at home or at work yes. if you have a boss. Let's talk about bosses who who are gaslighting people and saying you know, stuff that isn't true or talking behind people's backs. Yes. It's, it's a tough place to be to, to acknowledge that you're in a gaslighting relationship at work. And especially if the gaslighter is your boss, um, worse than if it's colleague, because you may feel like um, there's no way to shift it because you're dependent on your job, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if you're not dependent financially, most people who work for somebody certainly want to be in there uh, well thought of. So they're dependent right. on their boss or reputation or maybe a recommendation. Right. And so if you are in a relationship with your boss where either he is lying or she is lying to you or um, avoiding responsibility or, for example, you say, um, wait a minute. I'm sorry, I don't have what you're asking me for, but I remember the timeline a little bit differently. And your boss says, well, you know, aren't, aren't you going through the changes right now? Like you're in menopause. So like when that happens for you, um, your memory is not what it used to be, is it? And you walk out of there and you think, you know what, he's right. My memory is not what it used to be. That still doesn't mean you got it wrong about the timeline. Right. 
So um, in that situation, what do you do? Do you go back in and do you say, you're gaslighting me? Well, I don't think so, at least right. not in that way. Mm -hmm. What do you do if you feel like you're constantly being undermined? Uh, you ask for promotion, your boss changes the subject, uh, you, but at, but still in glad handing, you walk out of the office, you feel like he really likes me, thinks I'm a good guy, but he still didn't talk to you about your promotion, right? And instead left you thinking there was something wrong with you for asking about it. Mm. And um, the one thing that I encourage people to do all the time write it down um yep you're going to your boss's office you send him an email so glad we have a meeting today looking forward to discussing x yeah and then in the meeting you let your boss know i you know i like to document everything i'm going to send you an email when we're done and just to sum up what we said and some to make sure that i understood things correctly and so there's no blame yeah. of anybody. You're taking responsibility and then do it and then do it so that then the next time if you're accused of, you know, in a verbal pivot of having the wrong timeline, you can just say, well, maybe you changed, maybe you communicated something to me in between. However, the last time we met, this is what we said. Yeah, that's reality testing strategy 101. Write it down. Write it and, down. and that's another thing that I find so helpful for my clients when they get out is they have memories starting to surface, mm -hmm. write them down. Yes. And write down the conversation itself, because in that little snippet that I shared with you, mm -hmm. I was talking about the timeline. And then suddenly we were talking about my menopause, like mm -hmm. there's something wrong with that. That's a pivot in a conversation, independent mm -hmm. of the content of what he was asking me for. Right. And I would say, limit your interactions with the person who is gaslighting you. Um, notice what are triggers for that person and just try to avoid them if you can. Uh, surround yourself with people who you feel psychologically safe with. Yeah. And think about whether you um, it's bad enough that you think that you need to leave your job. Mm -hmm. Because often in freeing yourself from a gaslighting relationship, you will have to make a sacrifice. Yes. Yeah, it's not so clear. And a lot of people are so afraid of the unfamiliar mm -hmm. that they'll stay in a dysfunctional, yes. toxic, you know, job or, right. or relationship without making the effort to find out what are my other mm -hmm. options. Right, right. And the other piece in uh, in the workplace is when you're working on a project, if there's any way to bring somebody else in so that you have outside validation and corroboration of your mm. perspective, mm -hmm. and also uh, using your good friends. Maybe I'm repeating myself now. But it's yeah, no, yeah. It, it, you can't repeat it too many times because what I've been saying, especially coming back to the pandemic and the, the, the social isolation that resulted, you know, wow. because we were we were told, you know, don't hug and wear masks and don't kiss and all of those other kinds of things like we did anyway. But um, uh, it's really important to in real life to make efforts to re-nurture mm -hmm. real relationships, mm -hmm. build real relationships where you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're not on screens mm -hmm. and you're doing other things than work mm -hmm. that is satisfying and illuminating and expanding. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's learning a new dance, learning a new language, writing poetry, mm -hmm. doing artwork, people, People are multifaceted and we can sometimes get into a groove where we think just career, 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 I need to do this track. And it's not going to serve us, especially what appears to be this new reality that we're living with AI. Now, it, all of a sudden, the age of specialization has flipped to the generalists, the people who know philosophy, the people who know art and culture and music are going to be in the advantage, right, for being able to put systems together. 
instead of breaking things down into atomistic parts. What, so, what sayest thou? Well, it's so interesting that you talk about AI um, because I just uh, yesterday wrote an article that I published in Medium on um, are you being gaslighted uh, by your, a by, is AI gaslighting you? And there was a, an article some time ago in the times where somebody was having this exchange with this AI bot or however you speak about the AI machine. Um, yep. And even though the AI isn't a sentient being and uh, may not intentionally be gaslighting you, if someone, if you're having a gaslighting um, communication come your way, it does give you pause. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. If it makes sense. And I think that uh, if it makes logical sense, well, you know, you can't possibly love her because you didn't say that or whatever the, the lines were. Oh, you're talking about Kevin Roos yes, of the I, New York Times and Sydney, who's trying to convince him that his wife doesn't really exactly, love him. And that's exactly right. He should love her, that's you know, right. Sydney instead. And it's like, what? Right, right. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's clear that AI is not sentient. However, uh, it's relying on on data, many of which is incorrect. And so there are what's called hallucinations, which means things are coming out of nowhere that don't make sense, but mm -hmm. in sentences that supposed to make sense. And again, the issue is, wait a minute, I'm in charge. These are computers. <laughs> My reality matters. Right, right. And I, I last night, um, my husband said, come look at this. This is so great. Uh, Prince William is hugging Harry. And then the caption of the article was, it was an AI rendering of Prince William hugging Harry. And whether that will happen in a family reunion, I remains to be seen at any time. But the possibilities for gaslighting um, are just enormous with that when you can manipulate reality to look like one thing when right. it's actually another. So I'm, I'm, it's wonderful that we have technology. If we didn't, I couldn't even be here with you right now. But, right. Um, but I'm a little terrified. Right. So um, I'm, I would like to find a, a language interaction with you where, because in my mind, when I think of that, I think of deep fakes. I think of fourth generation psychological warfare deliberately aimed at mm -hmm. creating chaos and polarizing people against each other. Mm -hmm. So for me, I still have this un to influence brainwashing mind control frame in my head. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wanting to incorporate your, your language and your, your, your model. So uh, it, I'm sure it will be a process, but uh, it just seems to me like uh, Donald Trump, uh, gaslighter in chief, uh, cult 45, sorry, but I couldn't resist. No. Uh, <laughs> would be saying things that had no bearing on actual reality with total certainty and the effect would be gaslighting. Yes. But when I would listen, I'm like, oh, he's doing his malignant narcissist cult leader okay. playbook 101 thing. But if you were someone who bought into that promise that he really saw them in a way that other politicians had not, that he was going to save them in some very real way. Yeah. And you're listening with different ears. Totally. But that's why I think your model could help in a way that my model might be off-putting to people. Although I do my best to engage people when they attack me and say I'm brainwashed by the libtards and I'm in the cult of Soros. And I'm like, I wish George Soros would would fund my <laughs> my efforts you know but you anyway to be in that cult right? no but when they when they attack me i just say i'm brainwashed please tell me more like what do you mean by that to try to engage them into actually understanding that th there are models that one can use to reality test well what what um i think is important about the gaslight effect 
and the way I think about it is that um, it's really all about what's going on inside of you. If you're mm -hmm. paying attention, then you will have all the answers. You may not have all the tools. Mm. You need to go get tools. You may not have the social support that you need because you can't often do it on your own. But um, you have your integrity that you used to know about that you can reclaim. You have the way you see the world that you can find if you just take a step back. You have all the information that your emotions can give you if you just are willing to listen. Yeah, so I'm going to be so interested to talk further with you, collaborate with you, and maybe do some research with people who are like devout Trump believers who, you know, think that God chose him and uh, are in one of these new apostolic reformation mm -hmm. mega churches or... Um, people who think 9-11 was an inside job and, and uh, you know, the conspiracy theory. I heard Tucker Carlson quoting that, uh, you know, uh, as as recently as today. Wow. Um, but how, how to have many different avenues yeah. in to empower people, hey, it's your mind, it's your body, it's yes. your life, and... It's better to know what's happening and it's better to know yourself and like yourself and not just turn your power over to some external authority figure. And the cognitive um, tools that we have of positive self-talk and re positive reappraisal, they're very powerful tools. And just um, think, including yourself in the circle of people you give compassion to and being kind to yourself, it's like that are enormously powerful. If you yes. Take the time. To yes, indeed. So, Dr. Robin Stern, I am your fan. This Aww. is your recovery guide, and it really is a guide. You can really use it, go through it, answer the questions, reflect. And um, I really think this is a powerful tool to empower people to think for themselves, to reclaim their sense of selfhood. Um, and to move forward to a future you that's much healthier. Well, thank you, Steve. I really appreciate your kind words. And I love that you're elevating this important work, mine and yours, um, just in the service of humanity. Yeah, that's, it's, it's going to take a village. It takes a village. It's going to take a lot of, of experts and, and caring people and a lot of young activists who are brilliant Yes. who are like, you old people, what did you do to our planet? Yes. What are you handing us? Mm -hmm. Like, we, we need to engage them, empower them, so that, because um, uh, we need some real solutions, practical solutions. Yes, and the young people who are learning the skills of ruler in all the schools we're in, and in the schools in every corner of every state and around the world, they give us hope. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much, and we'll we'll uh, look forward to uh, to future conversations. Continuing for sure. this conversation for sure. I appreciate you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Mm -hmm.